Hello, everyone. You guys enjoying today? You having fun? You're not in school, remember that, all right? It's fun. I always like field trips like this, too, but this is actually a pretty good day. I think uh, uh, Megan over here has put on a really good uh, opportunity for you guys to come here and see what it's like to well, what the aviation world is about, or aerospace is about. And I think it's really nice for you guys to get this opportunity. I never had it. I wish I had. But anyway, I still uh, did get the opportunity to go to space. That was pretty darn cool, too, I have to admit. Um, I got to go on three space missions, two of them on the space shuttle to the International Space Station to build the space station. And then my last one was on a Russian Soyuz rocket to go for about six months to work, do science, and maintain the space station. So that was really cool. So what I'd like to do is show you kind of about uh, those missions, uh, what it was like to be on a shuttle mission, what it's like to go in the long duration, we call it, the six month one. And uh, kind of get to the idea of what uh, space is all about. It's really a really cool place to be. And the whole field that NASA does, the aerospace field, is also, I think, very, very interesting and very rewarding, too. I'd like to show you a little about that. But I'm going to start off with how I got to the spot to be an astronaut. You know, I took a little bit of work to get there, as you can imagine. And when I was young, not even even your age, uh, or even younger even, but I, I didn't even think about being an astronaut. Not until a lot older did I even think about it. When I was really young, I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, a place called Steamboat Springs. It was a great, uh, wonderful place to grow up. However, there was just a small town with a ski resort and some agriculture, and I really liked the woods. And so I, my career goals when I was young was to be a mountain man. Uh, that's what I was going to do. I was going to go live in the mountains and just do whatever the mountain man does. Uh, as I got older, though, I realized that's not a career. Uh, you don't make money doing that. And so I realized that was something that I needed to change. And as I got to be about your age, I realized that I like science and math quite a bit. And I wanted to head towards that way. Those are the things that I like to do. I found it very interesting. And so I started heading down that path. And then it was time to go off to the university or college. And I uh, didn't really too, too much I uh, thought about what I was going to do there, but I realized, again, I like the science and math, so maybe engineering. Now, I didn't really look into what types of engineering. I didn't even research anything. I remember there was no internet back then. And so uh, I just uh, went to school and uh, didn't even declare a major. I just said, I'll take some engineering classes, whatever that is. So I did that, and I went to the University of Colorado. Oop, whoa, that was a big jump. Um, and it was a great, great school. I, I really liked it, but it wasn't too far. I, again, I, I didn't do much research. It was a good school, though. And uh, after my first year of taking engineering classes, I said, OK, I do like engineering. I, I think I can do this. I, I think this could be something I could do as, a, as even a job, possibly. So I started, maybe I'll figure out how to get into the School of Engineering. Now, you guys have already went over and seen you know, the School of Engineering and stuff like that. I didn't know much about it at all, even at this, even at this age. And so I said, OK. Um, uh, but instead of talking to like a counselor or somebody with knowledge, which is really the right thing to do, I went and talked to a friend of a friend who was an engineer and asked them how to get into the School of Engineering. And they say, sign up for engineering physics because nobody likes it and nobody wants to do it since there's no competition. You can get in all the time. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I didn't even know what engineering physics was. And all it really is is engineering, a physics degree with some engineering classes. But I didn't even know what that is. I just signed up for it and went and, went and did that. And, and I got in. And he was right on all accounts. It was easy to get into, and it was not something that people liked, uh, including me. And so I did my sophomore year in that. And then after my sophomore year, I thought, well, maybe I should actually do a little research on engineering and figure out what I want to do. And so I went and talked to a counselor, uh, which I should have done earlier. But I talked to a counselor, and they said, sure, you can switch. And they should talk, talk about all the different ones. And then, but it's going to cost you another year of school, because they're already now, I've finished two years of school, and I haven't taken all the classes I need for this other change in program. They're like, oh, shoot, I don't know if I want to do that. So I decided not to do that. I decided I want to just, get out, just graduate. Not thinking, again, long term. It was all short-sighted here. And I said, oh, I'm just going to stay with this one. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to graduate. And, and, and I did, but I have to admit, so, so I think about this, I'm in a, in a university, they're not really doing the program that I'm really enjoying or liking that much. And then the University of Colorado is a beautiful place, and they had some few distractions that I ran into at University of Colorado. And uh, I, you know, I love to ski, I like sports, I like all these kind of things. And, 
And uh, I didn't do so well. I barely graduated from the University of Colorado. I did graduate, but that's about all I can say. And so after graduating from there, I uh, worked construction because with my GPA in engineering physics, there wasn't really any jobs for me. But I decided then I started to do some research, uh, what I wanted to do, more about different programs. And so I went then off to a different school called Florida Atlantic University. And this time I studied computer science because I researched it and I liked it. I thought, oh, well, this is kind of good. And now I had a goal in mind. I wanted, you know, I want, really want to do this program. I like it. I was a little more mature, all that. And I ended up doing really, really well at this school. And that, I think, helped me later on in life because it showed that, yeah, I made mistakes earlier on, but I learned from them. I, I adapted. I got better. I improved. And if you can show that, you can still make mistakes and do some great things in life. But don't worry about making mistakes so much. Uh, as long as you keep learning from them and improving yourself. That's the biggest thing I think you get out of all these things. So I got a master's there in computer science. And that's when, at the end of that master's, when I started thinking about becoming an astronaut. As I really started about, like, specifically, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? And the astronaut thing came up, and I thought it would be challenging physically, mentally. It would have a lot of adventure in it. It would be a cool job to have. And I just like the space, idea of space flight has always intrigued me. So I started that moment, put my application to NASA, and got rejected right away. Uh, matter of fact, I think I ended up with about six rejection letters from NASA uh, for the astronaut program, which is okay. But what they did, they offered me a job uh, at NASA to work on this airplane. It's called a shuttle training aircraft. And what it is, it's an airborne simulator of the shuttle, which is actually really, really cool. So the way it works is there's a pilot on the left side who's the astronaut who's training to learn how to fly the shuttle. And inside this airplane is a computer system that has a model of the space shuttle. So when the pilot makes inputs with a stick, it changes the model inside the software. And then we have other software called control software that makes this airplane do what the shuttle is doing. So it flies just like the shuttle. And we had to modify it to make it do this. Uh, like you see the main gear down, the engines are actually in reverse thrust during this flight so we can have the same amount of drag. It's really a cool airplane and I loved it. And I also then, besides being an engineer on it, I got to start flying on it, training it. I learned uh, then operations for aircraft and that helped out tremendously for later on in life uh, in trying to become an astronaut. So the same time I was doing this, I also went off and was working towards a PhD in computer science at Texas A&M University. Because I found out, if you look at people who are trying to be astronauts, it's not that the job requires it, but you're competing against some really qualified people. And a lot of the people have PhDs. So it helps if you get more education. So I said, if I really want to do this astronaut thing, I have to go get a PhD also. So I did that. And again, computer science, I liked it. I liked to learn. So it wasn't that difficult for me. It really was uh, something I liked to do. So I between having worked at NASA on airplanes, got an operational experience and a PhD, and I finally got selected in 1998 to be an astronaut. And then it took a few years before I got my first mission because NASA was thinking we're going to have all these opportunities for space flight. We had the space station coming on in 98. We're going to have several, seven shuttle flights a year with seven people on it. There's just all these opportunities, so they hired a bunch of astronauts which is maybe one reason I got in, but that's another story. Uh, but it ended up being, that didn't all come happen that way. We were getting four shuttle flights a year. They delayed the space station, all that. And so there's hardly any opportunities. So we had a whole backlog of people waiting to go to space. But I finally got in 2007. I got my first shuttle flight. And it was a great shuttle flight for my first one. It was to the space station to build it. And as a rookie, I got to be a flight engineer, which means I'm on the flight deck working with the pilot commander, going through all the procedures, helping to fly the vehicle. And then during the mission part of it, uh, I, was, uh, I did two spacewalks. I got to fly, fly both robotic arms. I did all sorts of stuff. It was, a, it was for the first flight, you couldn't ask for a better one. I pretty much got to do all the great stuff on it. So I really enjoyed that. And it worked out. We did well. And then, so a little less than two years, I got to do another one. And it's kind of funny, this one, because uh, now I've, I've done one flight, and it worked out well, but now I'm the lead spacewalker. I'm like the lead robotics, and so I've only done it once. And I was kind of questioning uh, NASA's intelligence at this moment, uh, but also the uh, pilot on my first mission, who was also a rookie this first mission, uh, was now the commander. So they moved both of us up from being rookies on our first flight to now being the leadership on the second flight, which again, uh, we were kind of questioning that, uh, I guess, uh, decision making, but it worked out. We actually did well and got this mission done. And again, very similar though to the uh, first one, with putting on a piece of the space station and building it. And then 
Uh, so what I'd like to actually show you right now, though, is what a shuttle launch is like. And we can kind of pair it to a Soyuz, which I did later. So a shuttle launch, about two and a half hour pr hours prior, we get in our orange pumpkin suits, head out towards the launch pad and the Astrovan, technically called the Astrovan. Yep, uh, a lot of creative names here. And we're getting in to see there's people here to help us suit up and, or, or strap us into the vehicle. Uh, the shuttle's pretty big. About two minutes prior, we're gonna get this call. Tells you to close and lock your visor. And start your O2, and that means you're actually going to launch that day. Yeah, and so that's why I only had two minutes to really think about should I be launching on this rocket with seven million three, pounds of fuel on it, two, uh, which is actually one, a nice way to do it. So six seconds prior, we get the main engines to light, and then at zero, the if the main engines are all good, the boosters will light, science. and that gives you that seven million pounds of thrust uh, at launch. It is an amazing amount of launch, uh, thrust at the beginning of our show. It knocks you off the launch pad so, so quickly. Uh, and by the time you actually leave the launch pad, you're already going over 100 miles an hour. It is just amazing how much acceleration you have on that vehicle. And that lasts over about two minutes and 10 seconds for the solid rocket boosters. And, and then they're actually going to burn out and then fall off and return back to Earth. But while those things are on, that vehicle is shaking too. You can hardly read the dials. It is just amazing how much uh, force is in those solid rocket boosters for in this during the first stage of flight. So then, after those things go away, you can see them pop off here in a second. They actually have explosive bolts that blow them off the vehicle. And then they, they parachute back down the Atlantic Ocean or picked up by ships in the Atlantic Ocean. And we continue on for another six minutes and 22 seconds, a total of eight minutes and 32 seconds to get to orbit. And that's 17,500 miles an hour. So that's five miles a second. So we are going awful fast, but we need to go that fast to stay in orbit. It's orbital velocity around the Earth. So it's kind of amazing. So when we'll do this, we will get out of the atmosphere and actually turn ourselves over to get speed sideways. Think of it that way, so we can get the speed going around. And that's how we get, uh, get this. We don't actually keep going straight Main up. Main engine cutoff is we confirmed. Want around it. And that lady on the left, we're picking her up. She's been on the station for about four and a half months. She was happy her ride was actually in space Discovery. coming to pick her up. Houston, nominal Miko, Ohms 1, not required. So that was a, a nice uh, launch. Uh, that was not required. And we both had a successful launch on both my missions. I was very happy about no, no major issues at all on launch. So after launch, then what we have to do is go ahead and get the vehicle kind of ready for orbital operations. And what that entails is to start off, we have to open the payload bay doors because that's how we reject all the heat on the shuttle. And then from that point on, we're setting up equipment like I set up, my job is to set up the local area network and all the computer systems on board. So we have computers that control the aircraft, but, or the space vehicle, but inside that do all our operations are run off of laptops. So I had to set up this whole laptop network, get that all going. Uh, and then the second day is all uh, based on checking our vehicle to see if it is in good shape for re-entry. And you guys remember Columbia at all, but it had a damage on launch that it, so when it tried to do its re-entry, it didn't make it. And so now we verify everything is good before we'll come back, and we spend all that time verifying the vehicle is good. Also check out our spacesuits uh, for our spacewalks that are coming up, make sure they're all ready to go. That was part of the second day. And then on the third day, it's rendezvous day. So we, see, we get close to the space station, we're going ahead, going through our rendezvous procedures at this point. And the first thing we do is, actually it's flown by the commander at this point, he'll fly underneath the space station, about 600 feet underneath. And so this way, the people on board the space station can take pictures and video of the space shuttle to verify again that we are in good shape. We have no damage at all to our vehicle. So that goes on, so we do that 600 feet below. Once that is complete, we'll move out to about 300 feet in front of the space station and slowly work our way back until we dock. And that's all flown manually by the commander at this time. You can see here, that's the commander flying this one, and he has basically two cylinders that are gonna have to match up. You know, two, think of it that way, is it's coming in, and there is a three inch tolerance on that. So it's a small tolerance for the size of these vehicles that we're trying to match up, going, to, going 17,500 miles an hour. Now, of course, the relative velocity is not near that, but it still is a pretty amazing technique to get yourself to be able to, to come in with a less than a three inch tolerance to actually have the docking occur. Once docking occurs, we can go ahead and suck the two modules together, create the seal, and then we can open the hatches and we can start the actual mission on board the space station. Now, let's compare that to a Soyuz. So I got to go on a Soyuz, which launches out of Kazakhstan, uh, which is south of Russia, it used to be one of the Soviet states. Uh, now, this place is kind of amazing to me because it has a lot of history. 
It's where the Soviets first started their launch program, or their space program. It's where Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, launched from. And so it was kind of really neat to, for me to be part of this tradition that they do. They do many traditions based off of what Yuri Gagarin did. Uh, there's like a special movie you have to watch uh, two nights prior to launch. And then the morning after you wake up from your, uh, the, wherever you slept in, the, the room you slept in the night before launch, you have to sign the door and say you slept here, that kind of stuff. And then another thing we have to do is on the way out to the launch pad, even though we've gotten our pressure check of our launch and entry suit, we have to um, take it off basically and relieve ourselves on the side, on the, on the tire of the vehicle that takes us out there. Because uh, that's what Yuri did before he did the launch, and you have to do everything that Yuri did because you don't want to be the one that causes an issue. Uh, so we just did all that kind of stuff. That was part of the stuff. So here's us actually two and a half hours again. That's kind of funny. It's the same time starting in our launch and entry suits. We've done our pressure checks. We meet up with the Russian Space Agency to get our final okay that we're good to go. The vehicle's good to go. Uh, they give us you know, the handshake, and we're on our way out to the launch pad. And it's kind of funny. This one, too, there were camels in the way on the out to launch pad that we had to stop and wait for the camels to cross the road. I thought that was interesting. Uh, on your way to space, you had to wait for camels. We get to the vehicle, uh, we climb up in the vehicle, and it's a very uh, small, actually, elevator up. You can only fit the three of us in the elevator. We get, because that's, uh, I think, to help you realize what you're going to be in. Inside that capsule is quite small. Uh, so there's not anybody who can go in there to help us get strapped in, and we have to do it all ourselves because there's no room in there. You can see it here during launch. There is not much room. It's about seven feet across about four and a half feet deep, about four and a half feet high, the room we have to be in there for three of us. And you can see there's also equipment in there that we're taking with us uh, on this part. So it's pretty well packed in there. And this is a little different launch. You can't tell on this one, there are no solid rocket boosters. So launch was a very different experience in the sense that there was no initial acceleration, you know, really tough acceleration right at the beginning. It was a slow start to this whole thing. You can hear the, the engines go and it started rumbling, but it was definitely no big acceleration at the beginning. So it took about nine minutes in this vehicle to go from launch to 17,500 miles an hour. And this is uh, looking out the window. And now all that view you saw that, uh, inside the vehicle was happened to be from a GoPro camera that I had accidentally left in my pocket because uh, they weren't allowed on the vehicle. And, but I wanted some video, so I forgot to take it out. Uh, and that's my story. So a rendezvous is a little different on the Soyuz. It normally takes about six hours from launch to actual docking uh, for a Soyuz because we don't have to check the vehicle out. So we can go straight in there and dock in. However, we had a software issue with ours and we had to down what we call it to the backup plan. And the backup plan was a 52 hour uh, rendezvous profile. So that means there's a little over two days inside that capsule. I did not appreciate that much at all. Uh, it was not a fun thing to do, I admit that. Uh, so that was one of the really negatives I had about the whole flight, but it was very happy for us to finally get to the space station. I was, I was quite overjoyed at that moment, uh, but pretty much in tears uh, to get there. But here we are coming docking. Now this docking is done automatically by the computer system. So what we can take over manually, if there are any issues at all, uh, we see we will take over. And this time we're docking to the Russian segment, and there's three people already on board because a normal complement of uh, people on the space station at this time is six. So there's Kuichi Bukata on the left, he's a commander. Misha Turin is the one opening the hatch, a Russian. And Rick Restracchio on the right, another American. So here we are coming in, and you guys can see we're all floating as we come on in. So my question to you, since you're all STEM area students, is, is there gravity in space here? I want you to think about that one more time. Yes, there is. There is gravity. But then why do we float? Uh, we're in free fall. We, you know what a free fall is? Think of you, on your roller, you guys been on roller coasters? Yeah, you're on a roller coaster, and you, uh, you get that first initial steep part, and you feel your stomach kind of up, and you feel yourself kind of leaving the seat a little bit, coming up in the seat. You're, you're in a free fall. You're going as fast as gravity wants you to go. Well, that's what we're doing all the time. We go around the Earth so fast that as we fall, we miss the Earth. And that's how come we're, we have no gravity in space. We float because we're in a free fall all the time. So that's what the space station looks like now. It's about 360 feet across, 283 feet long, and it has the volume of a large jet like a 747. So it's pretty cool how big it is. Now, 
A shuttle mission is much different than uh, being a long duration one. The shuttle mission was really, uh, it was just 10 weeks docked and we were going fast, fast, fast because we had to put something like this on the space station. Now this isn't us, this is an animation of what we had to do. And so, because actual flying that arm, it moved really, really slowly. You couldn't really show that. So this is the actual view out our windows and we use cameras also to help us figure out where things are as we fly. We had two arms, one on the shuttle, one on the space station. And we use those in conjunction to move these big pieces of the station out to where they're gonna be installed. And then once we get to that point where it's in position out there, we'll do a spacewalk to actually do the hookup part. And that's kind of my job. So I gotta do both the, the the spacewalk and the robotic arm operations on these missions, which is really fun. But a spacewalk, you notice here, it's the wrong term. We don't actually walk anywhere, right? We're floating and we use our hands to get around. But that suit is not an easy suit to work in. It actually has a mass of about 300 pounds. So it has, all, you can definitely feel you have something on you and when you push and pull yourself around, it has a lot of mass to move around. And the gloves are really difficult to work in. It's like two pair of gloves at least. There's actually three or four layers on those gloves, but it feels like two heavy pairs of gloves. And so you don't have much dexterity at all with that suit on. And we train for every shuttle a spacewalk I did, I did at least seven in the pool where we trained to make sure I could do it well and know how to do it very quickly and efficiently. So that was kind of a lot of training to get to be able to use that suit efficiently uh, on these missions. But these missions are all about the robotic arm ops and the spacewalks to get this new piece on the space station. And once we're done with all that, we've done all our spacewalks, Right. Then it's time for us to kind of relax and we get one ha afternoon for this. We take, uh, we'll put our patch on the wall of the space station where everybody else who's been there before to so help build the space station puts their patches. And then we have our little celebration dinner. It's usually in the Russian segment over here. And we play with our food because you can. And if you notice these cans coming up, that's uh, a lot of the Russian food is in cans. And it has that like quarter inch of the, I don't know what you call it, jelly or whatever, like the white kind of rubber substance is on stuff on food. And it's not very good. I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, but, but once you mix it up a little bit, you can actually eat it. Uh, I think it might be like cat food, but I've never had cat food, so I can't compare that. This is on the, on the shuttle side, so that's Ricky here trying to get out some of his food. And we have a little heater, we can heat up food. So it's not anything fancy we're eating here. It's all packaged, uh, and you could, again, Ricky's playing with his M&Ms. Uh, again, because it is actually fun to eat food in space this way. I say, they don't worry about taste, they worry about the fun factor, more importantly. Now in the morning on the shuttle, we have seven people inside the shuttle, which isn't a huge area. And we're all trying to get uh, going in the morning. We're, we're going to have a busy day ahead of us. And so it's kind of a, uh, we have to orchestrate almost who does what in the morning in a, in a rotation pattern. And it's kind of uh, difficult. Danny here is going to show you how to use the bathroom on the shuttle. However, he's not actually going to show you. He's going to demonstrate how to use the toilet. You can imagine what that is. We all have our own funnel, which I found interesting. Uh, but then, uh, and you, use, you can see what that's used for. And then when you need to go to the other one, you have a little straps that hold you down. And aim is quite important on that, just to let you know. <laughs> There's actually a simulator at the Johnson Space Center with a camera underneath there. So you can verify your aim. You don't use it, you just verify you're in the right spot. It's something you don't want to really look at, honestly, though. I'll tell you that right now. But when you do, when we're done with our mission on board the space station, we do back, we back away. And the whole idea is uh, uh, our next phase is to actually get a good view of what we've done and to photo document the space station now. So about 400 feet, we time it so the sun's coming up just as we get 400 feet. And then we'll go ahead and fly around the space station and take pictures of it again to try to photo document what's been going on on the outside of the space station. And that's actually, we sped this up because it takes actually to do the whole 360 degrees around takes 90 minutes, and we don't want to sit here and watch this for 90 minutes. But it's actually really cool to get this view of the space station and see it as, you, you know, what you've done. Especially after this mission, because it was the first time the four solar arrays were on the space station, and it looked uh, actually in a good configuration. Now, it's a little different. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, too, is what I learned on the space shuttle missions, because my first commander really drilled this into me, and I really appreciate this, was that you are going to make a mistake on your mission. There's no way you're not going to make a mistake. You're working for two days straight, working like 18 hours a day, and, and you're working as fast as you can, pretty much. Maybe not as fast as you can, but you're working at a very good pace, and you are going to make mistakes. So the first rule, you have to learn how to deal with it. You're going to say, you know, okay, why did I make, why did I make a mistake? What did I do wrong? Did I not think? Was I not paying attention? What was it? So figure out what that happened, why, why you made a mistake. Figure out how you're not going to do it again. 
and then you forget it. You have, he gave us 30 seconds to do that, to figure out what went wrong, to do that, and then you had to forget it because you had another task coming up right away, and you could not dwell on any mistake you ever made. And I really like that. I try to use that in life. I mean, we all make mistakes in life, but you can't really dwell on them. Just try to figure out how to correct it, how you do the best, why you did it, and so you don't do it again, and just then learn from it, and then just move on. Forget it, in a way. But that's what I think is actually good. And, and I, not all mistakes actually happen in space for us. And I got one good example of this one. One of the opportunities we get after flying space is we get to go see the President of the United States, which is a pretty cool thing, right? And so my first time doing this, I really didn't know what to expect. But we go in, we actually got to talk to, it was a George W. Bush. We got to talk to him for a little bit. And after that, we have this photo ops where he and Laura are in a room, and we all just kind of line up and go with our families in the room and take a picture. Fine, no big deal. So I'm with my wife and my youngest at this time, and uh, it was our turn to go on in. And we, we, uh, we, we walk into the room, and here President Bush uh, goes to my wife and goes, come over here, darling, in a nice little Texas accent, and puts his arm around him and hugs her, and kind of is doing all this kind of stuff, really friendly with her. So I go over to Mrs. Bush, and I start to put my arm around her. And I, I, oh, uh, luckily it was smart, and I said, I can't do that, right? This is the first lady. My gosh, I cannot put my arm around the first lady. But, so we're all setting up for the picture, and so in that position, I was like, ah, I can't do that. And I start to drop my hand, and they say smile, and they take the picture, right about here. Right, so if you look at this picture, uh, yep. This was our family of Christmas photo that year. But, and I put on it, just, just notice Laura is smiling, all right? So we all make mistakes, but, uh, yeah. So the main purpose of the space station is science. That's why we built it. It's a national laboratory. That's what we do up there is science. There was over 300 experiments going on on the space station when I was up there. I didn't work with all 300, uh, but I worked with probably over 150 of them. And this one right here is called Spheres. It's a little, basically, robotic spheres that you can program to do different things. And there's actually a high school and middle school competition to program these called Zero Robotics. And it's a competition you can do, and you can write software then that goes on the space station to control those. It's kind of pretty cool. But we did all sorts of experiments with those. We did fluids. Uh, we did combustion, which you'll hear. We did many things on the human body to see how that changes. But I thought here, combustion was actually really cool, or fire was really neat to play with because it does not burn like it was burned down here. You'll see it here, it burns as a ball. And then it's gotta figure out how to get the gases to move around, because it's using the oxygen, but it needs more oxygen to keep burning. And so it has this kind of little life to it, which is really, really cool to watch. And many things on the human body. And we wanna see how the human body changes. Here I'm trying to measure the size of my muscles, actually, to see if I've lost any muscle mass while on the space station. So do you do that? Uh, I grew lettuce was actually the first edible food grown on the space station. Uh, but they wanted to have it tested first before we could eat it. Uh, have her have to admit that maybe some of it did accidentally fly in my mouth, because it looked really good, and we don't have good food up there. So that was really good. Again, my, a lot of we, the things we found out about the human body is it's like aging very quickly. Uh, you know, you're, you lose bustle, muscle, you lose bone, uh, your immune system doesn't work very well. All these different things happen to your body way up there. So we figure out if we can find ways to slow this down or mitigate this process, it's good for everybody here also on Earth. And we are also guinea pigs on many different things that I talked about when we do these human body experiments. And uh, some of those things are, some of the science actually is pretty fun to do. Like this one I liked working on, I like, I like robots, so I had to work on Robonaut. Uh, and I got to rebuild Robonaut and actually put the legs on and put a whole new computer system and all sorts of hardware inside them, new, all sorts of new things. And it was really fun for me. Uh, so it was kind of a fun job for me. And I really liked that part of the science. It was great. And then more of the stuff when you're the guinea pig, it kind of gets less and less being fun. Like the one that was just, it was not bad at all. So every about three weeks, we had to take blood and urine samples. That wasn't so bad, but you know, you get used to taking your own blood, it's not a big deal. Uh, so that was just, you know, you wake up in the morning, do it. It's a minor nuisance. And other ones became more major. Like this, this one is called a VO2 max, where you're trying to make it, you see how well your lungs and your, your cardiovascular system is working. So they make you get you on the, uh, the exercise bike, and they make you go as fast as you possibly can to, to complete exhaustion, and then they measure all the certain things about it. But the one of the, it's something that I really didn't like doing, because you have all this equipment on you while you're working out, it's not fun. And the worst thing about this one probably is that you have to set it all up and take it all down when you're done. It's not like you go in a room and some other buddy does this all on you. You torture yourself on this one. So that wasn't too much fun. 
And then this is probably the worst one. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was not actually a chair like this, but it felt like it. So and this actually didn't happen in space. It happened right before we, we launched and right when we came back, because they were trying to measure if we had strength loss in our body, was it due to the fact that our muscles were weaker, or was it due to the neurosystem who tried to tell your muscles to fire, were they not working as well? So the way they, they figured out to test this, they put us in a chair, and it was a leg extension. So your chair pressing against a arm that would measure how much you could pull, push your leg out. Think of doing a leg extension, but it wouldn't move, it just measure the force that you could generate. And then they would make it go as hard as you possibly can, and then they put electrodes on your thigh and shock the crap out of you, right? And they did this over and over again to make sure they had good data. Uh, it was not a good one. We did not like this at all. And so that was their, their, their negatives to being a guinea pig, but it was all for science. So I guess that's okay. Mm. Now, the other things we did on space station was maintenance. We had to take care of the space station. That was our job, too. So um, we spent probably almost 40% of the time just making sure the space station was running smoothly and fixing things that were broken, because things did break quite a bit. It's a large vehicle or ship, even, you can call it, and it's, uh, it, things will break on it. So we would do all sorts of maintenance on board. And I, I actually like doing it. I like working with tools, so it wasn't a bad deal for me. And so the things we enjoyed quite a bit. Now that's a rack, and there's racks on all four sides of the modules on the US side. And we can move those racks around and put them, where we have storage space in there, we have electronic equipment in there, and we have science experiments in those things. So we can move those all around and put them in different spots around the station, depending on what needs uh, need to be met at that time. Now this is one thing, a piece of equipment that really needed to be fixed when it, when it broke, and that's the toilet, because we didn't have another one and you couldn't go outside. So it was a high priority when this thing broke. And actually, at the beginning, it broke a lot for some reason, because probably because it was made in about 1960. We bought it from the Russians for a really good price. Uh, but they kept charging a lot for all the, the components that we had to buy to fix it. Imagine that, it was a good deal for them. So I became an expert on the space toilet from Russia. Uh, this is a US lab. I just wanted to show you how busy it is. How, how there's like 30 experiments going on right in your view right there. And just it was just full of wires and computers and all sorts of things. And that's kind of the way station was set up. It was just a really busy place with stuff all over it. But you got used to it. It was good. We had to work on our spacesuits to keep those in good working order in case we had to do spacewalks. We were there. And another thing, when we got actual free time, which wasn't very often. It was in the evenings or maybe on Sundays. We would look out the window. The window, it's just fantastic to look back at Earth. Earth is a very, very beautiful planet. It's wonderful. We have this best view you can probably have of Earth. I have to admit, my geography got much better looking down at Earth. Now, it was kind of interesting because you don't look at Earth in the sense of uh, where each country really is because you don't see lines, right? Uh, so we would have to uh, know the mountain ranges and stuff. And those flashes are lightning. And uh, we could watch lightning at nighttime. It was really cool. There's always a lightning storm somewhere. And you could watch it traverse through a whole thunderstorm, like a 1,000 miles along. It was always really, really cool to watch. We got 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. Now, uh, we didn't really see all those because we only have to go down to this area called the cupola to look out the window. But it was really cool to watch them. They happen very, very quickly. That's normal speed of a sunrise. But this is sped up. And it's just kind of like show you the view that we had out our window as we looked down on Earth. It was really, really cool to see Earth this way. Uh, I say I got much better at all the different places around Earth and what Earth is really like by looking at it. We got to see the roars. Uh, they were very, very cool. Uh, we had about five times we got really good auroras like that. The interesting thing about auroras, of course, it's solar particles hitting our magnetic field, right, coming in. And those solar particles would actually damage our hard drives. So we knew when auroras were coming, when the hard drives started to fail. And I don't want to think about what that was doing to my body, because that would be taking the next step, and I don't want to do that. But it was really cool. Auroras were fantastic. Actually, you get to fly through them. Oh, this is just making, uh, uh, this is Alex, our German astronaut. He didn't smile much, so we had to find a way to make him smile. So, again, on the space station, you know, we lived there for six months, so you had to figure out how to you know, do your morning routines and all that stuff. And part of your routines is eating. And the food on the space station was not that good. And so we had different types. We had dehydrated food, and then we had packaged food. And it's somewhat, uh, some of the packaged food was like, Reed here, he's trying to find his favorite Cliff Bar. He's having a little issues. Reed had a lot of issues, but we're not going to go there on that. But uh, he just can't find it this day. Um, so it was definitely kind of interesting to eat on the space station. That is our table on the left. The most important item you can see is sriracha sauce. Uh, you got to make the food taste better. Uh, but we don't use the table to eat at all. 
We're just gonna have it to help get us uh, our food ready. So here we're getting, putting the water back in the dehydrated food. We have a machine that will do that for us. We can select how much we want, hot water or ambient water, and then we'll let it sit for about 15 minutes, take our scissors, open it up, and then we use a spoon to eat it. And the very important thing about this spoon, it is your one spoon for the mission. And so you don't lose your spoon. Uh, that's one thing that was uh, uh, drilled into you. It's a very important thing. You might have to borrow somebody's spoon and they're not gonna like it if you, do, you lose your own. But notice here when we're eating, we don't sit down, we kind of eat one course at a time, and we can let our food float as we do other things. We don't really care, as long as you kind of keep an eye out of it at the best side corner of your, corner of your eye, you can kind of turn away and do other stuff and then come back to it, and uh, you get really used to this whole environment. It is actually kind of fun to not have things drop when you let them go. Uh, and, and we get so used to just being in this position where our feet hold us in place. You know, we don't have, uh, you know, we're moving around because our feet are holding onto the handrails or hooked underneath the handrails. And that's how we stay in place while we're eating and doing all our work and stuff like that. And the interesting part about that is we lose the calluses on the bottom of our feet and gain calluses on the top of your feet. Because that's the only part you really use up there. It was definitely an interesting uh, aspect to it. But uh, we thought the invention for socks on the space station would be put like the leather pad on top of the sock would be nice uh, to help us protect the top of our feet. You can see like the package I have is just something we heat up and you eat it right away like that. It's kind of like uh, meals ready to eat for the military. And, uh, and the one thing about the station food is you don't get to select your, um, your food. It is a pre-programmed set of food you get, and, um, which wasn't a good thing, but they, had, they couldn't manage getting all your food up there at the right time, so that's what they came up with. And uh, I didn't appreciate that too much, but because um, there's lots of things like grits that were on my thing to eat, and I didn't like grits. Actually, they had grits with butter, grits with cheese, grits plain. Like, come on, all right? I don't eat grits, but oh well. But, so uh, food was, uh, it was edible. I'll give it that. Now, to mitigate our bone loss and muscle loss, we would work out over two hours every day. And we had three different pieces of equipment for that. This is called the resistive exercise device. So it's like lifting weights. We would do all the major lifts with this, all right? And then we had a treadmill. Notice there's a harness and a bungee system to hold us on the treadmill, because it wouldn't work so well if we just floated off. We could really run fast that way. But then we also had an exercise bike. And this exercise bike doesn't have handlebars. It doesn't have a seat. It just has a pedal system that you can, of course, uh, pedal on. So it was definitely interesting to ride these kind of things and work on these different types of equipment. But I would do the lifting every day and then alternate pretty much between the bike and the treadmill uh, to do cardio and once a day too with that. That did help. I did, felt good when I came back, pretty good. So I was pretty happy with the, with the equipment we had on board. Now let's come and talk coming back. We'll call you a shuttle first and a Soyuz. Shuttle actually ride back was not bad at all. It was just like being in an airplane, really. So we do a D over burn, which means light the engines and slow ourselves down a little bit. Just 200 miles an hour is all we have to slow ourselves down. So the next time we go around the Earth, we enter the Earth's atmosphere. And then we use the atmosphere to slow us the rest of the way. Do, to do that, we'll, we'll enter the Earth's atmosphere with a four degrees nose up attitude and use the, the heat then, or the, mall, the air, will hit the bottom of the shuttle, which has the heat shield on it, and use that to protect us as we go on in. And we do that to, till we get about below Mach 1, then we'll turn it over and fly it like a glider coming back, or like an airplane. And the commander lands it at this point. He does a little, uh, they call it a teardrop, which is like a circle around the airport, and then comes back and lands on a runway. It's about three miles long. We, ran about, we land about 250 miles an hour. Uh, again, there's not a lot of lift in this vehicle, so that's why uh, it comes down steeply and lands at a fast speed, because you just need speed to create the lift on this vehicle. But it was kind of nice to, I mean, the landing was really soft. You couldn't really even feel uh, when we landed on this vehicle. So it was a really, uh, just like being in an airplane, a really nice kind of comfy ride on the way back with a great view. Because you, when you, by the time you're in the atmosphere, you're actually, say if you're landing in Florida, you enter the Earth's atmosphere, which is 200,000 feet, and you're still in California. And it takes you, from California to Florida was 15 minutes to landing. So you are going fast across there. It's pretty cool to go across the United States that fast and see uh, the whole United States. That was cool. Now the Soyuz is quite a bit different. The Soyuz is a capsule, so we are gonna do it differently. But we, we enter into the vehicle, 
About three and a half hours prior to we're going to be on the ground, we get in our, our, our launch and entry suits again. And they, they are our pressure suits to, to protect us in case there is a leak in the vehicle. And then we go ahead and undock from the station. About an hour prior to landing, we'll do our deorbit burn, which again slows down about the same amount. But this one, when it enters Earth's atmosphere, it's at a much steeper angle because it's a capsule, and it comes down much deeper. And you get about four and a half Gs, while the most you picked up on the shuttle was about one and a half Gs. So it's a much greater uh, force coming through, and you go through the atmosphere much quicker. It's much hotter. That's a plasma on the outside of the vehicle. You can see from the window uh, outside the vehicle. It's really, really hot. We do have a heat shield, though. You can see the heat shield actually melt and come off. Pieces of it come off uh, through, the, through the window. It was really cool. But after this phase, we have a parachute, and we're about 15 minutes in on a parachute. And the parachute is quite uh, a dynamic uh, event itself, because it starts off small and gets itself bigger. And each time it does that, it's a big jolt with a spinning of the vehicle at the same time. So we get knocked around quite a bit. But when you land on the ground, it's like, uh, I would say, uh, driving your car about 15 miles an hour backwards into a brick wall. And that's what it feels like. Uh, but you, we have seats that absorb some of the impact, so it's kind of nice. It's not a big deal. And then about five minutes later, the research and rescue crews are there to pick us up and take us uh, out of there. And, uh, and we are pretty much then uh, done with the mission uh, at that point. And I, I'm on my way back to Houston to do tests. We do have a time for a few questions. I can do that. I also have some fun video I will show of us playing in space, which we do do on our Sundays. But I can answer some questions. If anybody have any questions at all? <laughs> yes, say loudly, please. How did my body readapt to gravity? Yes. So on the short missions, it wasn't much at all. Uh, I didn't really have to worry about readaption. It was just a little weak at all. Uh, but on the long duration mission, it definitely was some interesting aspect to that. The first thing for readapting was my, I would say, my balance. My inner ear. Inner ear gives you your, your, your balance, or your, it gives you actually a, ve uh, a gravity vector. That's the way I look at it. And in space, you don't need to have that. So it turns it off. So when I first came back from long duration, my balance was pretty poor. Uh, I, could, I could walk, but I was walking really slowly and unstable. Uh, but my body, though, felt pretty strong from working out. I was pretty strong, except for my core, because we didn't have anything to work our core. And that took a few months to get that all back. So overall, it took a few months to get myself back to 100%. Yes? How do you take a shower? Uh, we don't take a shower. Yeah, but we do have a washcloth. We put warm water, some soap on it, and wipe ourselves down with that. And that's how we clean ourselves up. I do that after every day I did cardio, right? So I'd sweat. I would clean myself up after that. Yes? Did I have to learn Russian? Yes, I had to learn Russian. Because our launch vehicle was a Russian vehicle, so everything was in Russian. We talked to Russian Mission Control, and you know, all the procedures were in Russian, and so we had to be able to do all that. And it was a good thing to do because I was going up with two Russians. So if I wanted to communicate with them, I better be able to speak Russian too. Now, they also tried to learn English at the same time because they worked on some of our stuff at the same time. So we all tried to learn Russian and English. That was pretty much the languages on board the space station. Yes? Could you pop it? Well, so you really can't pop it. It's actually, so the other thing go about water is it has, of course, adhesion and cohesion, right, the molecules. And so it, it, they are the dominant force without gravity. So you can really play with water much differently than you can here on Earth. So it's really cool to actually play with water in space. Yes. Yes. Does sweat, does sweat stick to your body? Yes, sweat definitely stick to our body. Some more fun stuff. So what would happen, like you're working out, we would, we'd also have a towel with us to wipe the sweat off because it would just start to pool on your body and become as big kind of like almost up, you could get up to a quarter inch of, like, of water on your body as you're going. And if that doesn't do good for actually getting rid of heat. You need evaporation for heat, right, on the skin. So we would have to try to do that in a way to try to do the best evaporation we could. And so we came up with the, the ways of kind of wiping the, the sweat off every like probably five minutes to kind of work it way that way. Yeah, way in the back. Sorry, one more time louder. Oh, what was I doing in the class in college? Yeah. Um, so which class? I mean, like, well, what did I do wrong or what did I do right? <laughs> I'm still having trouble here, and sorry. What did I learn in class? 
So, I, so I'll just talk a little bit. Yes. So and my undergraduate stuff, engineering physics was a lot of physics, which I actually like physics, but it was actually got a little difficult. And uh, I like more hands-on applications. And so I, which I think is really good what they have now in schools is a lot more hands-on work you get to do. And I didn't have that back in my university. And so that's what I really needed to help me learn what I want to do is have hands-on work. And so I wish I would have had more of that. It would have helped out tremendously. Yes. Can I get wet? Yeah, I mean, you can put water on your body. And if you notice, when, that, when we did the, um, uh, the guy put his head in the water and the water went all around him, he was actually underwater. He couldn't breathe because the water covered his whole face, covered all his air, air, you know, his nose and his mouth, and he couldn't breathe. So technically, he was swimming underwater. But uh, we actually didn't know it until he started choking, but that's another story. <laughs> all right. Yes? Oh, would I forget that the things didn't float kind of thing? Yeah, no, uh, gravity was pretty evident when you got back. Um, so I don't think, it, I, I never had that issue. I've heard about other people having that issue, but I never had that issue. I, to me, it was pretty obvious that gravity was back and I had to deal with it the normal way. Yes? What's we'll it again? Oh, how difficult to move around. When you first get there, it's a little bit difficult because you're, really, you're awkward, you're a klutz, right? You push off wrong. But you learn within a few days that you, uh, how to move. And, and by the time, like after six months, you move so easily. It's, it's, it's a lot easier than moving here on Earth because I can just push off and go. Now, what it is, though, it's a lesson in physics when you, when you move in space because it's all about your center of mass. So if I push off from up here, I'm going to move this way, but I'm also going to rotate as I go. Right, so I have to make sure I push either with my foot and my hand or through my center of mass, or I can do it on purpose to make sure I, I, I go down to grab another handrail to move up this way or something like that. So you get pretty soon, you know exactly how much to push which way to make your body do what you want to do. It just takes a little while to learn that. Yes? Did I smell? Um, I, you know, luckily, your body gets used to smells it has all the time. I'll put it that way. So probably, yes, but it didn't bother us. We all had the same situation going on. So nobody, to me, ever smelled bad at all. And so I, and we didn't, the station didn't seem to smell at all to me. So I never had an issue with anything like that on board. Yes? Uh, the pressure in the ears, did you feel that? Only when we did spacewalks. Because the station is pretty much at the same pressure we have right here, and the same pressure we launched with. Right? So I never had a change in air pressure the whole time during the mission until we go on a spacewalk. The spacesuit is actually at much lower pressure than we have right here. It's about if you're like at 30,000 feet uh, that high, that's how much pressure or low pressure we have in the suit. So we have to be on 100% oxygen in that, uh, in that suit so we can actually still stay alive at that very low pressure. But that's the only time we have to worry about the pressure in our ears. Yes? I'm going to get down here. Sorry. Go ahead. How long does it take you for to get used to being back on Earth? Uh, for me, to get totally back was probably six months, honestly. Um, and, you know, you get, I would say within like, you know, two weeks, I was like 90% there. But that last little bit takes a long time because my body was totally out of whack because my core was real weak, you know, and stuff like this. And it took a long time to get that back to being normal. And also, really, um, you, I worked out a lot, but I never got to stretch. Right, when I was up there, which is an interesting thing, and your body doesn't move. Like when I move around, I was always in the same position. Like here, even when you walk, your legs move and all that, my legs just stayed in the same position the whole time I wasn't working out. And so they basically became really, I say, stiff in a way. And so it took a year like, to get my flexibility back. It was really not easy. Yes? Uh, when you were going back to Earth, could you feel like the change in gravity? Could I feel the change? I felt our deacceleration is what I felt. That's what I felt in that. And that was that's been interesting, I felt, in the Soyuz, you know, I hadn't laid down or sat down for six months, right? And, and, and so in the Soyuz, you're actually in a bucket seat and you're laying down kind of on your back. And uh, I got four and a half Gs to push me in, which is a lot of weight, kind of pushed me down. And the interesting thing, I liked it because it's the last, first time I'd felt that, like, when you, know, you never get in a comfy chair and you kind of, kind of fall into it and you get really kind of, I just melt into the chair kind of thing. Well, I hadn't felt that in so long, I didn't realize I missed it until I got that. We have one more? One more question. It better be a good one. No pressure. 
I, oh, here it comes, the bathroom in space. You, know, you gotta have this one anyway. Um, so you saw what uh, Danny showed you a little about the shuttle one. Um, and you notice, uh, so we'll break it into two parts. The first part, which you can always imagine, the first part, is just what I, I consider it a wet vac, right? You guys know what a vet, wet vac is? It's a, it's a vacuum that can suck in water and air, right? So that's what we have, and it, and it separates out then the liquid and the air. Air gets uh, filtered and put back in the, in the system. In the space station, the urine actually gets put into a system where you actually recycle it all and, and drink it again. And seriously, it works, it works fine. Uh, the, other version, number, the other version is not as near complicated. There's a can, and in the can there's a hole. And in the hole we put a little pouch, like a rubber pouch, and you use the pouch. You basically sit on it, and you try to get best aim you can, and you try to get everything in there, because remember, everything floats, right? So you have to wear gloves, and you have to do that, and then when you're done, you wrap it up in the pouch, put it in the bottom of the can, and then you close the top of the lid of the can. It's really simple, but it's not a great process. All right, thank you very much.